our uh, invited our guest speaker is uh, professor alessandro taglebiu uh, he is from university of liverpool uk and uh, he'll be talking on the role of iron in shaping the response of ocean ecosystem to climate change uh, i would request everyone to uh, uh, ask questions uh, at the end of the talk now i would request uh, professor sunil singh to uh, introduce our uh, guest speaker thank you very much aninda dear friends good after afternoon and a warm welcome to all of you it gives me immense pleasure to introduce today's speaker professor alessandro taglia from department of earth ocean ecological sciences school of environmental sciences university of liverpool uk i know alessandro since last several years and have interacted with him during geo research committee meetings particularly in geo research data management committee where we are serving together and he is very much instrumental in uh, convincing data generator to submit the data to international data center for various scientific modeling purposes professor alessandro is very fine biogeochemical geochemical modeler with a deep understanding of physics chemistry of the ocean combining with mathematics professor alessandro is a professor at the university of liverpool and an ocean bio geochemist interested in how the cycling of resources in the affects biological activities and vice versa he is particularly interested in trace micronutrients and how they interact together to save primary production ecosystem structure and the global carbon cycle its science links numerical models at both global and idealized scale with both field work and synthesis of data sets he is heavily involved in the inter international geotrisic program and is a lead author on the ipcc special report on ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate he is a member of the governing council of uk challenger society for marine science and uk chair for score and sit on the royal society global environmental research committee uh, a little bit about his uh, biodata professor alessandro completed his bsc in marine biology from university of newcastle united kingdom in 99 and doctor of philosophy from department of geophysics at stanford university us in 2006 and he worked on several postdoctoral research program in france and south africa during 2006 to 12 and since 12 he is working in the university of liverpool at various positions and currently he is a professor in ocean sciences there he served actually many many scientific committees i think i cannot take name of all of them like international working group of the uk government marine science scientific committee on ocean research royal society global environmental research committee uh, council challenger society of marine science actually list is too long to read here and he is associated Global Biochemical Cycle and in Editorial Board of Scientific Data of Nature Publishing Group. He is co-chair of Data Management Committee of Geotrisic Program and member of Scientific Steering Committee of Geotrisic Program. He, in addition, he is holding many other academic responsibilities. He has published almost uh, more than 100 publications in reputed journals including Nature and Science with total citation of more than 5,000. and uh, he has produced uh, already eight PhD students and many more are working so now i uh, without taking more time i will invite professor alessandro to deliver his talk the role of iron in shaping the response of ocean ecosystem to climate change and we will have the question from the audience at the end of the talk uh, please raise your hand after that so thank you very much thank you alessandro please start the talk thank you sunil thank you for those those kind words of uh, of introduction and yeah thanks for the opportunity to talk to you all um here in the uk it's like uh, it's just uh, half past 10 it's a you know nice day hopefully it's a nice day where you are in in india or wherever you are joining the joining the talk and i'm very happy to be able to to join you guys here and hopefully you know soon we can do something uh, in person so today as sunil said i'm going to talk about the role of iron in how it shapes the response of ocean ecosystems to climate change and i'm going to try let's see if i'm successful but i will try to tell a a story about things that are represented up here in the upper left the sort of detailed chemistry and uh, speciation of dissolved iron in the ocean affects plankton here in the middle with consequences for the response of the upper trophic levels the the fish here is some tuna um to climate change 
this is work I've been doing as part of uh, European Research Council uh, fellowship that I that I have um, at the at the University of Liverpool. So before starting, I want to acknowledge a bunch of people, obviously, who have participated with me in this uh, this research. Uh, most notably, Lester Kwiatkowski in, in Paris, uh, my old postdoc advisor, actually, Laurent Bopp in Paris, uh, some fish ecosystem modelers in SET and uh, Ren and Vancouver, and also my group at the University of Liverpool. You know, lots of these ideas I show in the lab uh, group meetings with the students and, and postdocs. And so, of course, this has also benefited from their input and their, their ideas along the way. So to start with, I will start with something very simple. You know, you've all seen these animations, I'm sure. This is the measure of the productivity of the ocean here, the bio, the concentration of the pigment chlorophyll, which is present in phytoplankton. And we see this captured from the MODIS satellite from 2002 to earlier this year. And what you're seeing is basically areas of, that are green in, in color, are very, very fertile, rich ecosystems of the, of the ocean, and the blue areas are the, are the ocean deserts. And so we love to look at these patterns as, as biological oceanographers. And, you know, what I'm interested in, you know, what, what controls why one area is green and why the other area is blue, what controls the variability. We can see, for instance, here in the tropical Pacific and also up here in the uh, Arabian Sea, lots of variability. Um, and, you know, these these changes that we see in the phytoplankton concentration are ultimately controlled by the productivity of the phytoplankton. So we're going to use this term called net primary production, NPP, just to save some some space on the on the slides. And that is effectively the rate of carbon production by the phytoplankton. And and these patterns are not just nice to look at. They are really important. You know, they drive the vitality and fertility of marine ecosystems to give us nice things to look at and nice things to eat. Um, they also catalyze the transfer of carbon from the atmosphere into the into the deep ocean. So if we are worried about ecosystem services in that sense, the activity of these phytoplankton are really important and fundamental, I would say. We can see that link to the upper trophic levels when you look at less uh, dynamic but interesting maps of the uh, total catch of a fish on the left and the catch of one particular group of fish, the tuna, on, on the right. And we see those areas that we saw previously of high productivity in the tropics and up in the North Atlantic um, are areas of high fish catch. And equally, that area of high NPP, net primary production, in the tropical ecosystems is uh, really linked to this high catch of, uh, of tuna as well. So these are really important economically, uh, practically, in terms of delivering food to people. Um, and so if we are worried about the future, you know, and we are worried obviously about what the impact of climate change would be on these ecosystem services, and we assess this as part of the IPCC special report on ocean and cryosphere on a changing climate that Sunil mentioned in his very nice introduction. And in that, in that report, the, the impacts um, have been assessed. And here I just extract some lines from the summary for policymakers. But effectively, what we are, the future we think holds are global reductions in net primary production um, that then cascades into impacts on the biomass of animals in the food chain and also the maximum catch potential of, uh, of fish. So there is a real threat to these uh, important ecosystem services due to the impacts of climate change on net primary production. So how do we think net primary production is going to change? This is our sort of, <clears throat> excuse me, um, average view, <clears throat> excuse me, um, across a bunch of different earth system models that are doing projections effectively of the impact of climate change. And anywhere red, net primary production is predicted to decline. Anywhere in a kind of bluish color, there is a predicted increase in net primary production. And we see this strong difference by latitudes. In the equatorial tropical oceans, more or less all of it is red, including, uh, you know, Indian Ocean, uh, Equ Equatorial Pacific, big reductions in the, in the magnitude of net primary production in the future, counterbalanced slightly by some increases in high latitudes near the Southern Ocean and in the, uh, in the Arctic. So relatively negative outlook for net primary production, which then cascades into the impact on, on fisheries. So here I want to concentrate you more on the map on the on the right and anywhere red now is where the ecosystem, fish ecosystem models or so upper trophic level models are predicting a decline in the animal biomass uh, in the ocean at the end of this century. And so we see this decline that we saw in the previous slide for net primary production is really seen again here for the 
for the fish. Um, these differences are are important, right? They have a they have a social context as well as being interesting from a scientific um, perspective. So there's this very nice paper by a uh, voice in Nature Communications that I'd encourage you to look at. And what they did is they looked at uh, e exclusive economic zones and they looked at places. They looked they looked at effectively the projected changes in fisheries production alongside the Human Development Index. Okay, and so areas that are yellow in this map are places where we project that there will be big declines in ocean fertility, in fish production, and also that these are places where there are strong inequalities in, in living standards, in access to food, and all these kinds of things. And so what we see throughout the, the tropics, we see this double problem, that the, these large projected negative impacts uh, on fisheries are going to occur in places where they already have strong inequalities, limited capacity to adapt, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So these are really of great concern. And moreover, especially in the Pacific uh, and, and in the Pacific region, you know, fish are, all, are the crucial source of protein and also micronutrients uh, to human society. So these negative projections for how climate change will impact fisheries um, really have a strong social impact um, as well. But despite that picture, there's a lot of variability across different uh, ocean models in terms of how they predict uh, and net primary production will change. Here I summarize a bunch of information from a lot of recent CMIP models. And what I've done is I've shown you a time series of the multi-model mean change in net primary production and the standard deviation across the model. What we can see that in, in the global plot down here in the bottom right, we can see a slight decline with a reasonable amount of variability in terms of the sign. But we can see that for some regions of the ocean, uh, the, the predicted change in net primary production, there is a relatively small uncertainty, small standard deviation, like the Southern Ocean, um, or the South Pacific Gyre, the Subarctic Pacific. But in some regions, like the Equatorial Pacific, and also the Indian Ocean, we see an enormous variability in the uh, predictions among models. Okay, so models are predicting a decline. Here we focus mostly this talk on the Tropical Pacific, the Equatorial Pacific, the purple region you can see in the map. So the models are predicting on average a decline, but they are showing an enormous amount of variability between the models. And this variability is really important because it will affect the projections of changes on fisheries and things like that. Depending which model you choose, you can have a small change or a very, very large change. In other regions, especially in the polar regions, you know, the, there seems to be much more agreement amongst the models in terms of the predicted changes. And a good contrast to the Equatorial Pacific would be the Southern Ocean, where you see a very small standard deviation across 16 models uh, in terms of their predictions of change. So if we think about the Tropical Pacific, which I'm going to focus on in this talk, you know, Net prime production ultimately is being controlled largely by the availability of nutrients. So where there are plenty of nutrients, there's going to be plenty of productivity. And different nutrients are going to be the most uh, depleted in the water and therefore the ones which are controlling the, the productivity. In this map here, I'm showing you a compilation of data collected by Tom Browning at the Guillaume in Kiel. Um, of locations where researchers have taken samples of seawater and they have added uh, additions of different nutrients to see which nutrients uh, drive a response of the phytoplankton community in their sample. And then this, this tells us which one is limiting the, the community in situ. Anywhere in blue is a place where the addition of nitrogen stimulates, stimulates the uh, community greatly. And anywhere in red uh, are places where iron has stimulated the community most greatly. And so what we can see is throughout the Tropical Atlantic, for instance, we have a strong regime of nitrogen limitation. But if we look in the tropical Pacific, which will be our focus today, we see all of these red dots. So the system is controlled by iron. So if we want to understand what is driving the changes in productivity, we need to understand what is driving the changes in iron in the system. So iron, as, as some of you may know, there's a very complicated elemental, elemental cycle in, uh, in seawater. And it's affected by a bunch of different processes. The external supply of iron from external sources like dust or sedimentary margins. Um, the iron is taken up by phytoplankton and cycled by the upper ocean ecosystem. Um, 
iron has a complicated speciation. There's a lot of chemistry going on. And one important thing for iron is that it can be removed from the upper ocean, not just by biology, but also by a process we call scavenging, illustrated here in the Atlantic regime, uh, where iron is sticking to particles uh, and is being removed from the upper ocean uh, by this abiotic process. Okay, and those are the two processes that we're really going to consider today, the role of phytoplankton uptake and the role of scavenging. So my objective of my of my presentation here is to basically come from this angle. You know, usually when we compare the differences in the in terms of the uh, projections for net primary production uh, response to climate change, we compare different Earth system models. We compare the UK Earth system model to GFDL Earth system model to CSCM Earth system model to the French Earth system model. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. But when we do that, we are comparing the entire Earth system model. We are comparing a different atmospheric model, different land model, different ocean physics, different ocean biogeochemistry. So it's very difficult for us to isolate what actually is causing this large divergence in projections. So what we are going to do here is take one model and we're going to repeat a bunch of different climate scenarios uh, just by altering some assumptions around the biological iron cycling. And then we want to understand what variability this can induce in net primary production and how these uncertainties cascade into the implications for uh, biomass, animal biomass in the ocean and uh, fisheries. So the model we are going to use is the Pisces model, which I use very often in my, my research. And I think a lot, of, a lot of folks in India also have experience using this, this model. Um, it sits in the NEMO ocean modeling framework. It represents multiple different nutrients. You know, there's lots of, lots of dynamism in these uh, arrows here. Um, relevant for this talk, it has relatively complicated representation of iron uptake. It accounts for iron storage in phytoplankton, uh, dynamic recycling of iron by zooplankton and bacteria. So we think it's a good, <coughs> excuse me, a good candidate to look at the role of biological iron uptake. Yeah, iron uptake in the model, you know, as as all models, we have to make some assumptions in the model. And the assumptions we have to make in the model are about two things. We need to make an assumption about the maximum rate of iron uptake by the biology. So this we can think of as the, in this figure, the Romax uh, or the Vmax. So the maximum rate of iron uptake as a function of its availability in seawater. Um, and we also need to think about the ability of how able phytoplankton are to store iron. We know that phytoplankton can produce this molecule called ferritin here which is a way in which they can perform a process called luxury uptake. They can take up more iron than they need and store it in their cell and then mobilize this iron for use when iron conditions are poor. So we need to make an assumption about their maximum quota, the maximum amount of iron that they can uh, take up into their cell. OK, I'm going to call this term the bio FE max, the maximum biological removal term. And we set this to quite a high value in the model. And what I wanted to do was experiment what happens when we reduce this term and we run um, some climate change scenarios? So what we did is we set up a whole set of different models with different assumptions about the strength of the biological removal of iron. We did a spin up under pre-industrial conditions for a couple of hundred years. And then we ran what we call a pre PI control, pre-industrial control simulation from 1800 to 2100. So there is variability, but there's just natural variability in the ocean, no greenhouse gas evolution. And in 1852, we branched a scenario with the greenhouse gas evolution according to historical values up until 2005. And then following this RCP 8.5 high emissions uh, scenario from 2005 to 2100. OK, and what we're going to look at is what I call the climate change signal, which is going to be the change in net prime production from the end of this simulation, the last, uh, ten, last 10 years compared to the last 20 years of the historical period. OK, and so this absolute difference we are going to call the climate change signal. And then because we're going to repeat this experiment for a bunch of different uh, assumptions for iron uptake, we can look at how this climate change signal varies when we change the strength of biological iron uptake. And that I'm going to call the kind of delta delta NPP, which is the change in NPP due to climate change in the experiment compared to the change in NPP from this reference uh, simulation. So hopefully that's that's clear. Um, if we look at the bunch of simulations we did and we look at how the rates of net prime production evolve over the pre-industrial to 2100 period, both in absolute terms and normalized to the first uh, 50 years of the simulation, we can see that our model does not produce any massive changes in NPP. 
um, which is good. And actually, this model seems to be quite an average model. It isn't an extreme model. OK, and if we look in our control simulation with the standard parameter set, we produce this map of the change in NPP in mole carbon per square meter per year. And we see the same kind of figure I showed you from the IPCC report. We see decline throughout the tropics, increases at, uh, at high latitudes. So nothing really very surprising there. Um, so I repeat this figure up here just for context. And now what I'm plotting is basically, how does this climate change impact change when you lower the amount of iron uptake? First by half uh, and then by one quarter, by three quarters. And what we see is that we see a large anomaly in the, in the climate change impact on NPP centered on this equatorial Pacific region. What this means is that the fact that this is positive means that we are effectively compensating for the decline in NPP seen in the control simulation. So if you see in the control simulation, this area is declining. Um, when we change the uh, iron uptake parameters, we effectively alter the strength and magnitude of this decline in the region. It's notable also that I have not changed the axis here. So this, this anomaly in the climate change signal is of the same scale as the signal. OK, so this is not a minor contribution to the climate change trend. This is of similar order. OK, so it, it's interesting, let's say, to say the to say the least. And we can contrast kind of three regions here um, to understand what's going on. You know, in the equatorial Atlantic, we see a big decline in NPP, but very low sensitivity to changing the uh, iron uptake parameter. You see very, very weak change here, whereas in the equatorial Pacific, we see also a a big decline in NPP and a strong sensitivity to uh, iron uptake. And I would say Indian Ocean, you know, for the, my colleagues there in, in India and friends, um, we see a big decline here in the Arabian Sea and the kind of monsoonal signal and some hint of a, of some something going on here in the Indian Ocean. But um, we're not going to focus on that for this talk. We're going to focus in on this strong anomaly or strong uncertainty in the NPP change. So it's, it's centered on this biogeochemical province uh, called the Pacific Equatorial Divergence Province. And so this is the map of, uh, of Longhurst with these different biogeochemical provinces. So now we are going to focus in just on the model results from this region, which is the black region uh, in this figure. You can see the, the thick black outline I've done. And if we just zoom in there and we look at the NPP changes uh, as a function of time in percent, uh, with a kind of 10 year smoothing to get rid of the wiggles. We can see first the black line, we see nothing really changing. And then around 2050, we see a big decline in NPP in this region by about 12%. If we halve the iron uptake strength or, do, or reduce it by three quarters, we can either reduce this decline and more or less stabilize NPP throughout the whole simulation. So instead we end up with a few percent of decline. Or in some situations we can even slightly increase NPP in this region due to climate change. So there's a big sensitivity here. What's important is that these simulations, they only really start to diverge after around 2050. OK, uh, and they are driven mostly by changes in iron uptake rather than iron storage. But I'm not going to dwell on that um, right now. So what's happening in these simulations? Um, we can see the big NPP changes, but how is the iron cycle reorganizing itself? So when we lower iron uptake by a lot, so let's take this bio FE max 20. So it was 80 originally, right? So it's a four times a reduction. What we see is that iron uptake in the lower panel declines as you would expect. And the decline is less when we halve it, right? So far, nothing so exciting. This just shows that the model is doing what we see. But what we see is that there is a reaction by this other iron cycle process, which is the scavenging. So anytime when we are reducing the iron uptake, we are increasing the scavenging. OK, so there is a shift in the balance of the iron cycle. OK, um, we are reorganizing the dominant way in which iron is being removed from biological uptake into scavenging. And this appears to be linked to the impact of climate change on net prime production. What's happening in the model over the time is that this nutrient limitation regime in the Equatorial Pacific is changing. OK, this is the control simulation and this shows you the fraction of this uh, province, which is limited by iron in the red line. So about almost 90 percent and nitrogen around 10 percent. And what we see is after again about 2050, as climate change intensifies, we see a real shift 
in the dominant limiting nutrient in this region. Iron is becoming less limiting, nitrogen is becoming more limiting. Okay, as nitrogen becomes more limiting, then the reduced supply of nitrogen due to the climate driven changes in stratification reduces NPP in the control simulation. And what we see is when we change the iron uptake, here reducing it a small amount, here reducing it a large amount, we really change this transition to nitrogen limitation. When iron uptake is very low, this scenario, by a few max, we see that actually there's only a very small change in the fraction of the area that is iron limited. This region remains strongly iron limited. Um, and because of this, it becomes much less sensitive to the changes in nitrogen supply due to climate change. Okay, and NPP is not really affected very much. The small change in iron uptake, we see a intermediate position. There is some declining in iron limitation, some replacement by nitrogen limitation, but much less than the control simulation. So what we wanted to do then was to think about whether we can, you know, given the fact that these models show such a difference in the projection for the, um, for the impact of climate change on net prime production, can we reject any of these scenarios as unlikely? Yeah, can we use data on NPP during the historical period to say, okay, clearly this model is out of the range of the data constraints, and so we can reject it. And we're going to do this in two ways. Firstly, we're going to look at the absolute values of net prime production in the, in the Pacific Equatorial Divergence province. And then we are going to look at a kind of relative constraint on the system. Okay, we are going to use the fact that we have historical data on the variability of NPP as a function of sea surface temperature due to the El Nino variability in the region. Okay, so we can compare the delta NPP as a function of the change of sea surface temperature due to El Nino from the satellite data and compare that to the models to see if any of our models are too sensitive to SST change, not sensitive enough, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, this is the results of this assessment. And the, the main point is that we cannot discriminate, we cannot reject any of our models basically. Uh, this shows you the time series of NPP in absolute terms over the historical period from all these model simulations. So we are, you see we are somewhere between 3.2, 3.6 petagrams of carbon per year in this province. And then you see the future changes and the decline in the control and the very small changes in the scenarios. And then what I show you here are three database products um, which are attempting to quantify net prime production from satellites. They're all using MODIS data. Uh, but there are different algorithms to calculate NPP. Um, we're not going to go into the dif differences, but the main point is, as you can see probably yourselves, is that there is more variability amongst the data-based estimates than there are amongst our models. And it's very difficult for us to use this data-based estimate as a way to say one or other of our model scenarios is not correct. So then we move to the NPP as a function of SST. So this is the NPP anomaly during the historical period in percent, and this is the SST anomaly in this Nino 3.4 box, which is commonly used for the uh, for the um, El Nino analyses. And then we have a bunch of satellite constraints. And so basically, there's a lot of points here, but we want to look effectively at the regression lines. Okay, and the dash line. The thick line and this dash line and this dash line represent the extremes of the two satellite constraints. So you see they are wide, they center here, and then they open up again. And all the colored lines represent the same regression lines from our model simulations. So what we can see is that our model simulations are right in between the range of variability. Again, they don't sit outside of the range. We don't have a line that looks something like this, for instance, very, very steep uh, or something like this, you know, very, very shallow, very, very limited sensitivity. So again, we, we cannot really um, discriminate against our models. And, and actually, it's not really very surprising because the model's variability doesn't really emerge very strongly until around the middle of this century. OK, so for the period where we have data, the models seem to perform actually very similar. And it's only when we get into this strong climate change scenario in the future uh, that we start to see the model projections diverging. So what's going on here, right? I mean, I've alluded to it recent, uh, earlier. So when we modify biological uptake, we effectively, what we're doing is we're changing the ability of the operation to retain iron. Okay, the Equatorial Pacific is an iron-limited region. 
Okay, it's going to remove the iron is going to be removed, but the way it is removed seems to be very important for the response of the system to climate change. When biological uptake is high, and iron is moving more on this arrow towards my very, very bad representation of phytoplankton, um, iron is retained quite effectively in the upper ocean via these recycling pathways linked to grazers and bacteria. And what that means is that there is a very efficient retention of iron. And this means that even though the system is iron limited, it's actually only very weakly iron limited. There's actually still quite a lot of iron being cycled in the upper ocean. In contrast, when we lower biological iron uptake, so when this arrow becomes less important, iron instead is being removed by this scavenging process. It's sticking onto particles and it is very inefficiently retained in the upper ocean because instead of being cycled around by bacteria and zooplankton, the iron is being lost. It's sinking out of the upper ocean. So our different model scenarios, what they, what they do is they set up different levels of balance between biological removal and scavenging removal for iron in the historical simulation. And this assumption and the way we make this assumption is apparently changing the magnitude and sign of the impact of climate change on NPP in the equatorial Pacific region, um, which is very, very interesting. And obviously then suggests that different models are making different choices about this, uh, this process. So then we wanted to understand how important these changes were for uh, upper trophic levels and marine ecosystems, you know, to come back to this broader context of, um, you know, provisioning and uh, marine resources. So what we did is we took our extreme example, this BioFEM axis, the, the weakest level of iron uptake and the control simulation. So the, the big, the end of the full envelope of our experiments. And we we forced them through two different, <coughs> excuse me, uh, ecosystem models. One is called Ecotroph. It's a relatively simple quasi empirical model that looks at the flow of energy through trophic levels and it's effectively driven by a net prime production which regulates the supply of energy at the base at the lowest trophic level and then sst which effectively controls the transfer efficiency of of buyer of energy up the trophic level system and then we used a more mechanistic model called epicosm which is a yeah, like I say, a mechanistic model. This is driven not by MPP, actually, by the biomass of plankton, the biomass of zooplankton, the temperature, the oxygen, even the velocity field of the, of the model. So we're looking at a very mechanistic uh, system. So let's see what, what occurs here, okay? So the first is that we've got these two models, Ecotroph in, in blue, Epicosm in red. Let's concentrate on the thick line first. This shows you the change in consumer biomass uh, in the control simulation. Okay, so in both models, you can see the the red solid red line and the solid blue line. They are declining. So we see a decline of somewhere between 12 to 30 percent um, between the models. And so the models themselves have an uncertainty between each other. But in each of these models, when we instead run the scenario with the lower iron uptake, we reduce a lot the impact of climate change uh, on this system. OK, you can see the dash line is now the dash blue is much less of a decline. The decline is now reduced by 17 percent relative to the control. And in the epicosm model, we see that, <coughs> excuse me, the decline is reduced by around 10 percent relative to the control. So these uncertainties that we have about how iron limitation is affecting NPP response to climate change is cascading up the food chain to an uncertainty on apotrophic levels. So just this simple uncertainty within one single model, which has no answer, no difference in ocean physics. You know, the physics is exactly the same in all of our scenarios. Just changing the iron uptake, the strength of biological iron cycle, adds around a 50, 60 to 80 percent uncertainty in the projections for upper trophic levels. And this raises obviously additional challenges for people who want to manage the impact of climate change uh, on fisheries. And actually, we can go even more broader. We can look at the whole tropical Pacific Ocean from 30 south to 30 north. And what we see is that there is a really strong relationship between the fraction of this ocean region, which is limited by iron, and the change in NPP due to climate change. So as climate change reduces the degree of iron limitation, we reduce the level of NPP. OK, so in other words, if you have a model that has only a small, small amount of change in the fraction of this region that is limited by iron, this model will produce a small change in NPP. 
In contrast, if you have another model, which produces a very big change in the iron limitation in this region, you will have a big change in NPP. So we suspect that differences in how climate models deal with this, deal with iron limitation, nitrogen limitation in the tropics, is going to contribute to the uncertainty uh, we see across models. If you remember, this region showed a large variability across the models. OK, so what about the Indian Ocean? Let's think about that for a second. So the Indian Ocean is shown here and it the absolute uncertainty may be smaller than the equatorial Pacific. But what's interesting about the Indian Ocean is that this uncertainty is really about the, the sign of the change. Is NPP going to increase in the Indian Ocean? Is it going to decrease? Um, and what we know is actually when we look at these uncertainties across models, if we look at the total uncertainty in net prime production, if we add up the uncertainty across models in the tropical Pacific and the Indian Ocean, this explains about two thirds of the global uncertainty in NPP. So understanding what's going on in the Indian Ocean is really, really critical in reducing our overall uncertainty in the carbon cycle. So you guys researching on that, this is a really important problem. And so we know in the Arabian Sea, you know, this is an area of very high productivity. The models are generally predicting a low, a big decline in productivity in this region. To my knowledge, this region, we are thinking that it's controlled by iron and maybe grazing. Um, and this makes it actually very similar to the equatorial Pacific. So it's quite possible that this region is also going to be very vulnerable to these regime shifts between iron and nitrogen limitation in the future projections, um, especially between the Arabian Sea and Monsoonal province. So I think this really merits some uh, closer look uh, to see how much this contributes to the uncertainty that we see here. Okay, just to finish, I want to talk a bit about how we can reduce uncertainty. You know, how can we actually help the policymakers figure out which one of the models is most uh, realistic? Okay, so I think we need to do this. We need to constrain the patterns and dynamics of resource limitation in the models. Right, the way the models are limiting the rate of net prime production is critical, and we have very little uh, information on this from data. The traditional way of doing this, which is, you know, sailing to the ocean, collecting lots of samples, conducting experiments on deck is very, very time consuming. You can see the data set is not very large. You know, we don't have many data from the Indian Ocean. So I think we need to think about new approaches and maybe the role of genomic measurements, uh, which can give us information on microbial physiology. And I just want to give a couple of examples of this. The first one is this very classic study by Max Saito published in Science in, in 2020. And what this shows really nicely, this is a data set from Hawaii to Tahiti. And so we are going from north to south. We are going through a zone of low nitrogen, high nitrogen, low nitrogen again. We are seeing a trend of high iron to low iron. And we see these proteins that the, the, the organisms are producing, which are linked to nitrogen stress, acquisition of different forms of nitrogen, iron stress, or the uh, economization of your cellular costs of nitrogen, uh, iron, sorry, really give us this direct insight at a very fine spatial scale and temporal scale uh, of how the phytoplankton are responding and how they are stressed by these nutrient concentrations. This, you know, Mac, Mac's group have expanded this somewhat. Here we see another example here for like looking at one organism here. This is the same transect going across this zone of high nitrogen uh, nitrate concentration in the cold, uh, the, the extent of the upwelling signal in the Pacific. And we see again these big changes in the signals of iron transporters, nitrate transporters here in a dinoflagellate to show how this one dinoflagellate group are changing their physiology in response to the changing environmental gradients. This is actually the mechanisms we are trying to capture in our models, but we don't have observations to constrain them. And finally, some of you might have seen this recent paper by Adam Martini's group in uh, Science, came out very recently. Uh, where they use metagenomic data uh, to focus in on different genes, which they, they think are linked to iron stress, nitrogen stress, and phosphorus stress. And then they can collect them from these uh, geotraces style cruises um, to map out the degree of iron stress in the ocean, the degree of nitrogen stress, and the degree of phosphorus stress. And so you can see, you know, high number means high stress, 
Um, and, you know, these also look like very promising potential approaches to um, so you're giving us more insights into how the microbes are actually reacting to the environmental changes in the ocean. So to finish, I'm going to conclude. I'm going to say that um, hopefully I've convinced you that our view of how climate change will affect net prime production in the tropical Pacific is, is quite uncertain. And this uncertainty is controlled by the changes in iron limitation in response to biological iron cycling. This uncertainty cascades up the food chain into a big uncertainty in how apotrophic level systems are going to respond to climate. And I suspect this may be a common feature of upwelling gyre regions. So the Arabian Sea, potentially also the Benguela upwelling, you know, these should be, I think, common features. And in more in general, our projections of net prime production change from climate models, earth system models, they're really sensitive to the shifts in resource limitation. And at the moment, we don't have enough observations to discriminate amongst models. So we are left with this very large uncertainty which is not very helpful, uh, to be honest. But hopefully new constraints on resource stress, and if we can prioritize their, their use in the ocean, we can start to use them to reduce uncertainty in our projections. And if we can reduce uncertainty in our projections, then that will really help us as a kind of global community mitigate and manage the effects of climate change on these key ocean services. Um, so much of this is in more detail in this recent paper we published in Global Change Biology. I encourage you to have a look at it if you're interested. Um, and I think with that, uh, Sunil I'll, and everyone, I'll, I'll thank you for, for listening. I'd be really delighted to take any, any questions from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessandro. I think it was a fantastic. And you have coupled, I think, climate change and production change and iron limitation and all those things in very nice way. And at the end also you showed uh, the omics and tra trace metal, how that can, uh, omics can replace uh, some of the study, which is very difficult to do. And uh, I think we in Indian Ocean trying to do something very similar to that. We have taken one cruise to see the trace metal behavior with uh, omics. So I think uh, with this, I will request now uh, all the audience to, uh, uh, ask questions if they have. So we have one uh, immediate uh, hand raise is from Rajiv. So Rajiv, please ask the question. Uh, thanks a lot for a detailed talk on iron limitation and its implications on primary productivity. I just wonder whether these models also account for benthic iron flux and how significant is it? Especially in the context of Arabian Sea because we have a very strong OMZ and that's likely to contribute a significant amount of iron from the sediments. Thank you, Rajiv. Very, very nice question. Yes. So, some of the models are accounting for benthic iron sources, but not, not all of them. The model we use, Piskezi, does account for benthic iron sources. And in a way, the fact that we have benthic iron sources um, in the tropical Pacific coming from the Peru margin is the reason why that if the system remains iron limited, that the evolution of the system is then not necessarily only controlled by changes in, in upwelling supply of nutrients. Now, you make the point about the Arabian Sea and the low oxygen. I think that's a really good one, you know, because what we I think our conceptual understanding is now that we have the, there's the combination of these benefit inputs and then a low oxygen environment really means that the iron that is added has a much longer residence time in the ocean. So it can be much more significant. And I think we don't represent these feedbacks very well because I'm sure as you know, we think oxygen will change uh, in, the, in the future as well. So is, there is a real opportunity for a kind of feedback between the iron supply, oxygen, net prime production. And at the moment we are not accounting for this um, at all in our, in our models. So thank you, very, very good question. And uh, another thing, uh, why do we see a very significant change after 2050 in all of these models? Such a yeah. rapid change. Yeah, that's interesting. I think it's at that point, there's clearly a tipping point in the in the scenario, right? I mean, it's at that, that's beyond my area of expertise actually, as to why 2050 is the key, <laughs> the key kind of date but clearly it's at that point where the 
where the change in, in, in greenhouse gases is driving a, some kind of threshold change, probably in the stratification of the, of the ocean. But I'd, I'd have to look into that a little bit more, I think. Um, yeah, good, good point. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you for the questions. Uh, Alessandro, when we're talking about benthic, particularly to see in the Arabian Sea, we have some contribution from hydrothermal. I think the Carlsberg region of so how they will contribute to this uh, productivity and all because uh, they are not supposed to come to the surface but uh, in many cases because of uh, uh, this buoyancy lot of iron is supposed means seem to be coming to the surface so how how they are uh, taken care yeah so again it, it very much depends on the different models in, in our model we as you know sunil i'm interested in hydrothermal uh, iron so in, in our model we are including a hydrothermal source of iron but i think very few i mean maybe no other earth system model for the climate change scenarios is accounting for hydrothermal systems and i think what's interesting if you think about the different external supply of iron to the ocean dust sediments hydrothermal they all have different kinds of sensitivity to change. You know, we, we expect dust will be show a lot of variability, right? And I think in Indian Ocean, this will be very important as well, linked to aridity, anthropogenic activity, you know, lots of things. Sediment, as we spoke, is going to be linked also perhaps to changes in oxygen, changing organic matter flux to the sediments as well. But the hydrothermal vents, you probably would not expect much variability. You know, the hydrothermal systems are changing on really, really long time scales. But what's affecting them, perhaps, is the, the ocean circulation change, right? So if you are adding iron at the, the deep ocean, ultimately the circulation is bringing it to the, to the surface. And so if through climate change you are altering these circulation pathways, um, you can change things um, significantly, I think. Okay, so we have one next question from uh, DST NCECCR. I think uh, Prashant. Yes. Sir. Uh, hello, Professor Alexandro. So we are from Professor R.K. Munster Lab. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So, so, as I understand from your results, basically you have seen the association between the exposures. And the outcome, which is your NPP. So, just wanted to know that have you ever uh, looked into the causal modeling to infer what is the change of iron affecting the NPP? I didn't catch the, the, the part of the question. Sunil, did you hear the question? No, it, it is resounding, actually. I'm not able to catch that. So, yeah, so I see it yeah, so I'm, I, the query is, uh, you have your results, if I understand correctly, show the association between the exposure variable, which is iron, and the outcome uh, in your case is NPP. So have you in time looked the, to the causal modeling, that how much uh, NPP is going to change, uh, per unit change of, the, uh, of, the, of your uh, you know, iron? So I'm not quite sure of that. I'm sorry, I could. Prashant, you can you can type your question in the uh, chat chat box, and you will take it. Uh, that would be great. I'm really sorry. It was just. Yeah, yeah. No, actually, he he is calling from Banaras, so I think uh, some some problem is there. Okay, so uh, we uh, we have a hand raised from uh, Dr. Achyutan Kurti, Kurti Kurti Sir. Good evening. <coughs> It was a very interesting talk. I was a former scientist of National Institute of Oceanography. Are you able to hear me properly? I am perfectly. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I was uh, listening to your uh, uh, talk and also uh, uh, looking at uh, the models that you have been bringing out. I was uh, interested to know about uh, the blooming aspects, phytoplankton blooms, particularly the harmful algal blooms. I did not see much of mention in your talk about that. But uh, doesn't iron play an important role in that, although it is very seasonal and uh, location-based? Uh, I, do, I don't know whether you have taken into account in your models uh, the algal blooms, particularly harmful algal blooms. Thank you for the question. Yeah, I think 
So obviously the models there are accounting for the, the blooms of, of phytoplankton in general, but specifically about the, the HABs, the, the harmful algal blooms. You know, actually, I think it's a big gap in, in the way we are doing the climate change projections, because I, I'm not aware of any modeling group which is trying to make a mechanistic projection of the how the emergence of harmful algal blooms will uh, change in the future. Generally, when people are doing modeling of of harmful algal blooms, to my knowledge, they are doing more a kind of statistical exercise. You know, they are trying to make correlations between sea surface temperature anomalies, chlorophyll, and to try and project on a really a short time frame for kind of management, right? If you if you want to know if there's going to be a hab coming next week in your in your your fishery or something like that, you really want to know that, right? But I think yeah. there is a big disconnect between this sort of short-term kind of operational forecasting and the kind of longer term projections for you know i think of it a bit like kind of extreme weather you know in the atmosphere you know hurricanes and things like that you know yes we, we need an operational uh, projection or an operational sort of management tool but for for the climate change response what we want to know what i would love to tell you is kind of do we know anything about whether the probability of harmful algal blooms will be more prominent in the future, less prominent, which regions are more likely to uh, experience higher level of harmful algal blooms. And so I think it's it's a big gap, you know, a, an equivalent one I would think of are, you know, ocean disease. If you think of things like Vibrio uh, in the ocean, cholera, right, in the in the seas. This will, we, we think this should expand a lot due to climate change, due to warming. We should start seeing things like Vibrio and, and, and Habs as well in areas of the ocean, maybe like UK, where we don't see them now because it's cooler. As we start to warm, we become vulnerable to these things. But to my knowledge, no one is making a kind of mechanistic assessment of this. And, and I think it's a big, you've raised a very important point. We tend to focus just on climate change, right? We don't have yet an ability to integrate all these other anthropogenic human induced activities and impacts on the ocean pollution disease overfishing is another one you know all these kind of systems so yeah thank you for the question i'm sorry i don't have a good uh, a good answer thank, thank you thank, <laughs> thank you very much thank you okay so thank i you. have got the question from the person uh, who was not able to uh, make it clear so what he he is uh, asking is have you looked into the causal linkage between iron and NPP? If I understand correctly, your models are showing association between the two variables. Yeah, thank you, Sunil, for, for reading that's that. that. And, thank, and thanks for taking the time to type it in. I realize that's a little bit, uh, <laughs> little bit frustrating. Um, so yes, I think, well, what we showed uh, and what we, I think we, we understand as, as kind of oceanographers is that there are different limiting nutrients which are affecting net prime production. And it, and whether or not iron is the important one depends which ocean you are in, right? And so if you are in the tropical Atlantic, right, let's imagine we take the plane to Bermuda, the Sargasso Sea, um, we can add all the iron we like and we will not stimulate any productivity because the productivity there is really being controlled by nitrogen and, and phosphorus. In the upwelling systems, in the equatorial Pacific, Benguela, I think also the Arabian Sea, you know, iron is limiting the rates of productivity. Um, and so I think we have evidence to know that we know that the model is predicting iron limitation in the right regions. But what we don't know, which is maybe your, your question, is the is the linkage, the mechanistic linkage between changing concentration of iron and changing net primary production. You know, this is the big gap. And this is where I sort of try to end the talk by saying we need new data to show us how are the phytoplankton responding to the change in iron. Hopefully that answered the, the question. Okay, okay. So we'll move to the next question. This question is from uh, Vineet from Ahmedabad. So, Please, Benit, go ahead. Yeah, hello, uh, uh, Professor Tadiyabu. That was a wonderful talk by you. And uh, uh, are you able to hear, uh, hear me? My voice is quite clear. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, uh, okay, yeah. So that was a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. And so, uh, 
means you have shown the relationship between like iron limitation and and nitrogen limitation in the in the ocean and and uh, going into the future how those scenarios change the NPP. Uh, one of the things that were discussed earlier was uh, because if you go into the future and there is a climate change taking place, uh, certain things are going to change which are related. For example, dust it it will tend to increase at some regions and tend to reduce at some regions. How these models are going to incorporate those dynamic effects and also other question is that for example uh, because of climatic changes if there are changes in the circulation pattern and those are dynamic changes so how these models they take, take into account these aspects. Thanks Vineet, I uh, hope you're well. Um, thank you for the questions. I'll yeah. take the, cir the circulation one. Um, yes there's a there's a emergent ocean circulation change in these in these models. The models are representing the changing ocean physics as a function of climate change. Obviously, there are differences amongst the different Earth system models in terms of the kind of ocean physics model they are using and how that then responds to the changing atmospheric. And, that, and that's that's part of the challenge we have when we compare different Earth system models. We are comparing completely different ocean physics models, completely different ocean biology models, completely different atmospheric physics models, and completely different land models. All that they have in common is they are being subjected to the same greenhouse gas scenario, right? So we don't really understand. So what we have looked at, I guess, in this presentation is to try to understand how important are the differences in the biogeochemical parts by just using one Earth system model. What we don't know is what contribution the different physical assumptions are making uh, in contrast with this. And I think, you know, in the Indo-Pacific, that can be very important because obviously there's the Walker circulation in the region um, and models are showing a lot of divergence, I think, in terms of how they predict the Walker cell will change in the future. And they also, I think, don't reproduce the observed changes in the Walker cell over the last few decades. Um, so there's a big challenge also with the ocean physics. And then you ask about the dust, and that's an interesting one, because of course, if we change climate and we change human activity, we change the production of uh, aerosols from the land, which that can then supply iron to the ocean and may amplify or mitigate against some of the changes in iron limitation that we see in the ocean. And I think we have now models which are including dynamic representations of the aerosols. I know the UK Earth System model is doing it, the French one is doing it, um, also some of the US ones, but no one is really, we don't have a, I certainly don't have a, I don't know of any paper which is quantifying the contribution that this dynamic aerosol interaction is making. And I think, you know, really there are two ways the aerosols are important. The first is the desert dust, you know, changing aridity, uh, changing land use, which is uh, opening up uh, natural, let's say, deposition of aerosols. And then, as we know, there is the strong source of iron from uh, anthropogenic activity, biomass burning, uh, combustion, which is providing aerosols to the ocean, which, which has a completely different spatial pattern to the natural dust, which is more linked to the desert regions and, and these kinds of things. And then, you know, there's also the fire, right? Natural fire, you know, we've seen these recent fires in Australia, California, you know, the evolution of, of fire as a source of iron to the ocean as well. So there's a very nice study to do <laughs> about how accounting for these different modes of variability in the different aerosol sources um, would combine with the changing ocean physics to drive the evolution of iron imitation. So I realize I haven't answered your question, Vinny, uh, apart from really to agree that it's it's an area that we need to look at. Yeah, and uh, just, just to add complexity to the uh, circulation pattern, for example, in the northern Indian Ocean, there are uh, circulation patterns which are dependent on the strength of the monsoon. So if you have one southwest monsoon, you have different kind of circulation. So that also adds to the complexity. Just one last question I have is that uh, for all these predictions that you go in, into the future, what is the temporal resolution? So are you able to uh, see in, what is the temporal, temporal resolution of the prediction? So the models, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so your, your point about the monsoon is a very good one. And I would only 
add to that by saying that most of these models are also quite coarse resolution. You know, they are not resolving the fine scales. And I think in the Indian Ocean, you have a very complex system that, you know, you could question whether the uh, coarse resolution Earth system models are representing the, the dynamics of the physics, both on the Arabian Sea monsoon side, but also on the Eastern Indian Ocean with the, you know, Indonesian through flow and all these kinds of dynamics uh, of the system. But asking about the time resolution, um, well, we run the models at very fine time resolution, right? Um, so we, we can have seasonal daily variability, whether we think it's interesting to look at the daily very, you know, we don't tend to look at them because it, you know, it's a, obviously a massive data set. If you are looking then at hundreds of years of data at, <laughs> at daily resolution, but the time resolution, I think, you know, what we are missing, I think, so while we can run the model at fine time resolution, ultimately we are limited by the ability of the, the time resolution effectively of the atmospheric variability. Okay, so if we are not resolving storms and things like that, then it's probably not sensible to look at anything less than kind of monthly resolution for the ocean. So we have a fine time resolution, but we are not, you know, going back to the earlier question, we are not really accounting very well for the extreme events. You know, the atypical uh, storms, typhoons, hurricanes, what they do to the nutrient supply, what they do to the ocean, ocean physics. Yeah, like spiking things. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much, and I uh, wish you a wonderful day. Okay, Thank so you. Actually, we have few questions, uh, more questions. Uh, next is Naman. Please ask. Yeah. Hello, uh, Professor Alessandro. Am I audible? You are very audible. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for this wonderful talk uh, on iron biodiversity and its impact on you know uh, ecosystem and climate. So I have basically two questions. Uh, first is the follow-up question to uh, Dr. Raji, who asked that uh, uh, we might have uh, how we are accounting for the iron source from the sediments. So as far as I know, we we are taking this uh, reductive dissolution uh, of uh, this iron from the sediments that contribute uh, to the input. So, but what about the uh, non-reductive dissolution that can also be an important factor in uh, and. Uh, as a case, we have a large input of this lithoranic flux in the Bay of Bengal that comes from this larger rivers that can contribute to the non-reductive iron from the sediment. So would that impact? And the other one is, as you said, that uh, uh, in the uh, our uh, iron, when we did the control experiment to check the uh, change in net primary production, we see a very large decline in the control. But as we decrease the uptake of iron, uh, it shows a relatively very less uh, change. Uh, but as you said, that uh, change in uptake would, uh, we will be less retaining the iron in the biological uh, phases. So we will be decreasing the remineralization of that. So wouldn't we ex 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 expect that uh, we would see more reduction in the change of net, uh, net product productivity because we have lesser iron now? And it is going to more more going to the scavenging if we reduce the uptake. So I could not uh, like get that. Could you explain? And uh, so also on your views, do we really need the regional uh, mod uh, modeling to uh, to like uh, tell more accurately about the iron cycling and its impact on uh, productivity? Because uh, one of the cases is sediment influx we have where. Naman, you got muted. Hello. Uh, yeah. So, do we need regional models? Uh, because, uh, as you said, the models are very coarse, and this circulation pattern, also the dust, uh, may change regionally, uh, and we would like to have a regional models. So, your views on that? I would like to know. Thank you, Naman. Uh, lots of lo lots of good questions. Um, so I'll try to try to answer them all for you. So the, the first point about the sedimentary input, you're absolutely right. We, we tend to, when models are accounting for sedimentary iron input, we are really representing the reductive dissolution. So we are connecting the sediment iron input to the kind of oxygen demand of the sediment. So in, 
shallow systems or systems that receive large organic matter flux, um, we get a large flux of, uh, of iron. But as you correctly point out, that's not the only way iron gets into the into the ocean from the sediments. And there's also this process called non-reductive dissolution, which is more about the kind of, I think of it as a more of a kind of physical kind of like turnover of the sediments, which is mostly bringing iron uh, in colloidal size fraction into the ocean. And, and we are not, the short answer is that we are not uh, including this. Um, you know, we worked on a recent paper in, in PNAS that was led by um, Dr. Will Homaki from University of Leeds that you, you could look at where we used iron isotopes actually to show that this non-reductive dissolution is potentially a very important source of iron because, of course, unlike reductive dissolution, it can operate over the oxygenated areas of the ocean, right? Um, and we know that there must be some link to nephaloid layers, some interaction between the, the shelf slope, you know, the slope criticality, you know, the internal wave that hits the, the margin, depending on the orientation of the margin, you can have some promotion of the iron uh, remo uh, introduction into the into the ocean. And I think what's interesting is that there's some idea that the, the iron that you bring in from the non-reductive dissolution is associated with organic carbon. So it has these kind of ligands which are binding the iron, perhaps increasing its residence time. Whereas the iron that is coming from the non, the reductive source in the low oxygen system, it's coming as iron two maybe into the seawater. Unless you have a very low oxygen in the seawater, this iron is going to precipitate very very quickly. Um, so the point I would say is that you are absolutely correct, right? Um, it's an important thing and we need to think about how we modify our iron models to account for the non-reductive source and how climate change then might impact that, you know, and, and it will change it because if you change ocean stratification, you will change the internal tide dynamics, you will change the energy being put into the sediments and you will change then the remobilization potential. And so I think this is a very interesting problem to address. Um, and this, you then asked about the mechanism, about why, why when you have lower iron uptake, do you see more of a decline in, uh, no, higher iron uptake, do you see more of a decline in uh, NPP? And so the reason you see that is that in the mean state of the model, right, when we spin up the model in the, in the contemporary climate, we are effectively getting to a roughly equivalent condition of the ocean, but we are getting there with a different balance between iron uptake and iron scavenging. You know, we are building our house of cards, but the, the foundation, we get the same castle, but the foundations are slightly different, right? And so the strength of iron limitation, it's still an iron limited system, the tropical Pacific in both scenarios, but the strength of iron limitation is much weaker when you have high biological uptake because in the model, and I think also in reality, we see a lot of recycling of the iron in the upper ocean. So the iron is low, it's still low relative to nitrate, but it's much higher than it is in the situation where the iron is being lost by scavenging. And the problem is when you have climate change, then acts on this mean state, right? You stratify your ocean, you re reduce the intensity of the upwelling in, in the Pacific. So you are reducing the supply of nitrogen to the upper ocean. So they are kind of in a competition then, right? Iron and nitrogen, which one is limiting? At the moment, there is more nitrogen than there is iron. And with climate change, you are reducing the nitrogen. And I guess the quest, the key is when you have biolo high biological uptake, you are cycling a lot of iron in the upper ocean. So you are able to buffer the amount of iron in the ocean. And so the nitrogen uh, can quickly become more limiting. And then once you make nitrogen more limiting, then the NPP will follow the decline in, in nitrogen. In the other scenario where we have a very, very strong iron limitation, that I use my very poor graphical representation with my, with my hands here. If we have a very, very strong iron limitation, so very low iron, loads of nitrates, we have to lower the nitrate a lot more before the nitrate becomes important. And in our models, 
you know, we use this concept of a Liebig law of the minimum, right? That the most limiting nutrient is the one which drives the growth rate and the primary production. So it's only if you can make nitrogen the most limiting nutrient that suddenly then nitrate will drive the, the growth rate. And, and that's what's happening in the two scenarios. You are basically changing the kind of resilience of iron limitation in the ocean. If you can retain the system as iron limited throughout the whole simulation, it doesn't care about the nitrogen change. It's not important. Uh, it's only going to be affected by iron changes. And your last question about regional modeling. Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. And I think, you know, I think what we need now to really advance our understanding is to learn more about mechanisms. You know, lots of people are, are we can get a lot of data from CMIP, from climate modeling comparison projects on the internet. You know, I'm sure you, you your colleagues and that you can get the CMIP six data, you can download terabytes, petabytes of, of data, and you can compare different models. But we are never really learning about the mechanisms in these different models, because all we can get from the Earth System Grid Sharing Foundation is the, the fields, right? The iron concentration, nitrate concentration, et cetera, et cetera. I'd like to think what we learned, what we learned about during the experiments that I showed you in the presentation was because we were able to do experiments with one model. We were able to make changes to the model and rerun the model, testing the importance of the different assumptions, in this case around iron uptake, but they could easily have been around other components of the model. And I think that's where we need to make more progress. We need some more targeted mechanistic experiments with models. And you know, if we take the Indian Ocean as an example, right? we all are interested in the Indian Ocean. You know, you could easily argue that that's a system where we do need a higher resolution model. It would be very interesting to know, you know, if you use a higher resolution nested model forced by the big Earth system model at the boundaries, but you are representing the Indian Ocean at a finer scale. How important is that if you use the, exactly the same biogeochemical model? And then you can also imagine doing extra experiments, focusing in on some of the questions we have been talking about in this very interesting uh, Q&A session about dust, sediments, you can repeat your experiments by changing assumptions about sedimentary supply, aeolian supply of iron, how is it affecting? Once you have the capability to run the experiments, you can do like you do in the laboratory, right? You can have a control, you make some experiments, you look at the difference from your experiments to the control. Many of the groups who are using Earth system models, they are so busy doing the scenarios for the CMIP you know, to create all of this data that goes into the IPCC report and uh, all these other things, they don't really have time to like also do experiments. I think it's it's very understandable why they are not uh, why they are not doing it. But I think other groups then have an opportunity to do focused experiments using perhaps the boundary conditions or the atmospheric scenario from the big Earth system models to uh, probe into the uh, into the mechanisms. So hopefully I answered your question, Naman. Thank you for the, yeah, the question. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Professor Rajendra, for such a detailed explanation. It okay. really cleared a lot of doubts. Thanks. So actually, we will move to the next question. We have another four questions. So okay. Not getting late, uh, Alessandro. No, that's fine. Carry on. Okay. So the next question is uh, from Samir Damare. Samir, please go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, Alessandro. Can you hear me? I can perfectly. Yeah. Hi, Sam. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is in a continuation of the previous one, also, where you spoke about the models uh, just giving the quantification, not the mechanism. Uh, in one of the recent cruises, we have done some microcosm experiments with regards to the iron addition to the water column. And uh, we are looking into the transcriptome as well as the uh, genomics what's going to come up and how much. When we talk of iron, it's basically the bioavailable, which is taken up by the organisms and the genes which are responsible or the enzymes. Have you thought or looked into a model wherein these genes are also incorporated? Yeah, very good question because I mean, um, <clears throat> well, yes, we have because we are very often very frustrated by the fact that the way we represent nutrient limitation or these kinds of things is not actually testable with data, right? Because even though it's convenient in the model to have this uh, Liebig law of the minimum, it doesn't conform to data. So we have been working 
mostly with protein data, actually, rather than metatranscriptomic. But it's a kind of similar point. You know, it's about understanding how is the organism changing its physiology, biochemistry, in response to the environmental gradients. And the big danger of the law of the minimum approach is that it does not care about the non-limiting nutrients, as I explained, right? Yes, That's why yes. the nitrogen is, but in reality, the organisms, they are being, they are responding to the selective environmental pressure for from the whole, the whole orchestra, right? All of the instruments, not just the trumpets that we are worried about. Right? We are worried about all of the instruments in the orchestra and how they set the growth environment for the organism and then how the organism then has yeah, as you say, the metagenome, it, it's kind of the opportunity, the options that the organism has at, at its disposal. Uh, and then the meta T or the meta P in terms of how it's actually, how is it reacting to this or this situation? So we have been working with a colleague in Canada, in Dalhousie, where we have been trying to uh, basically come up with a completely new model of phytoplankton growth that is ignoring elements right so not worrying about nitrogen in the cell iron in the cell phosphorus in the cell how much is limiting which is the most limiting <laughs> etc but actually modeling the proteins and protein synthesis amino acid allocation of proteins in the cell towards different cellular jobs right nutrient you know transporters uh nitrogen metabolism photosynthesis Maybe you have some stress responses like antioxidants that you need to put proteins into. And it's only once you have kind of ticked off all of those expenses that you have proteins able to divert towards ribosomal synthesis and, and growth. And so we are trying to reframe limitation. You know, now our model, our conceptual idea of growth limitation is about scarcity, right? It's about resources that are lacking in seawater but actually, I like to think of limitation as a kind of accumulated costs, right? If your accumulated costs are bigger than your reserves, well, then you have a problem, right? Just like your bank balance. If you have too many outgoings, uh, you know, that affects how well you can live on the same salary, right? And it's the same in the ocean, I think, you know, that we don't see a strong relationship sometimes between the metatranscriptomic data and the metaproteomic data in the ocean and the nutrient concentrations, right? Because the nutrient concentrations are a standing stock, which is a, might be a very dynamic uh, equilibrium. So I think, yeah, there are lots of opportunities around, yeah, using these kinds of things. I mean, the metatranscriptomes, I think, in the field, they provide a fantastic way to evaluate hypotheses coming from the model we are trying to use them a little bit right yesterday actually i was talking about this um with the tara oceans data um you know for some organisms you know obviously you might have seen the paper by martini and led by ustic in science recently with the metagenomic data but you can only use metagenomic data for even for things like prochlorococcus it's, it's maybe questionable as to whether you are really learning about the response of the organism but for eukaryotes, you know, they have massive genomes. There are so much redundancy. You are not learning a lot from the metagenome. So then you need to look at the response variables, right? The metatranscriptomic or the metaproteomic data. So I think it's a very good avenue. As you know, though, I'm sure the big challenge with the metatranscriptome data is to have the reference database. You know, you need to know, you need to know what you are looking for <laughs> before you once you know what you are looking for you can produce a very detailed assessment of what is happening. But that's the challenge, I think, as I understand it, is the reference database. And also, how do you normalize your data? Because you are moving from one sample to the next. You may see a big change in the abundance of a set of transcriptomes. But what you need to know is you need a reference. You know, for proteomics, they use a reference protein right, to normalize. You need a housekeeping gene or something like that that you can normalize to. But it's a very exciting future because what i really find great about it is because you can non-invasively sample the ocean you are collecting data from the ocean without manipulating the ocean right and you are collecting the data at the same scale as the biogeochemical data as the trace element data you know you can collect it from the ctd cast um, so you have this fantastic ability to connect the, met, the genomic responses you see with maybe the micronutrient data that Sunil's group might uh, might measure, for instance. So very exciting times, I think. Thank you.
Okay, okay, Alessandro. Actually, uh, before going to Hamanti, there is one question from uh, actually uh, Dr. Jokim. He is uh, listening this talk from uh, Lamont, New York. Listen. Oh, right. Yeah, so he is asking. Uh, I will read for you. Since the Arabian Sea is transless. Uh, transition to population dominated by mixotrophs. Do the models have mixotrophy? No, they don't. Very good question. So the mixotrophs is a big. This is also a massive challenge to our our simple conceptual model of how the uh, how the ocean is working. Now we were just talking with uh, Samir about the the difficulties of this Liebig law of the minimum in terms of like nutrient limitation, but also the fact that we assume that all of our plankton are autotrophic organisms and there's a strict partitioning in the in the models between autotrophs and heterotrophs and so we don't account for mixotrophs and i think you know a colleague of mine ben ward that you may know down in southampton he's working a lot on on these things but we don't yet have a good understanding about how a mixotroph you know a model that includes mixotrophy how that will affect the projection of something like net prime production because Obviously, if in mixotroph has a great advantage, if you reduce the nutrients, well, then I, you can just eat things. You can become a heterotroph. Um, so we we need to assess this. I think that's the big question. And I guess the point I'm trying to give you from this presentation and the, and the Q&A that we're having here is that for things like net prime production, there's a lot of uncertainty in the models, right? There's a lot of uncertainty. These models, these earth system models are still very simple in terms of the degree of complexity that they are representing, both the nutrient limitation, but also the presence of harmful algal blooms or mixotrophic organisms. And, and you know, there's a lot of opportunities, I think, for us to learn more. Uh, and I suspect, you know, the uncertainty that we see now in the models, you know, the figure I showed you, the time series with the error bars, my personal view is that is not actually yet a true reflection of the real uncertainty in NPP. Because we, we we must imagine that as we start to account for these extra levels of complexity in the system, we are only going to increase the uncertainty larger in NPP, which only puts the urgency more on the need for data, you know, some way to discriminate against these uh, different scenarios. So thank you. I'm sorry I don't have a good a good answer for mixotrophy, but it's 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 a big deal because most organisms are mixotrophic. Actually, I think it's not it's not just dinoflagellates uh, mixotrophs, which is what you are taught at school, right? So, <laughs> or at the university. But uh, you know, diatoms can be mixotrophs as well. Um, it's very very widespread in the in the ocean. Okay, so next question is uh, Amanti. Please ask. Hello, uh, hello, Alessandro. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, many thanks for giving us this wonderful lecture and it leads to many questions. So I already got some of my answers while listening to them. I would like to ask you uh, three points. The first thing is the silicate, because you know the relation iron and silicate they have, like you have the low iron, then the diatom silicify more. And the, I mean, I don't know how you address this in your model. The second thing is we assume the community is going to be same, like in the next 100 years when you project your model. But there are also low adaptive strains which are, you know, slowly appearing in the ocean. So they replace iron with copper. Or you showed the paper of Marchetti the, about ferritrine and the pinnate diatom dominance. We repeatedly see in all our experiments when you have low silicate and low iron, the few pinnate diets in particular, they dominate in all the experimental enclosures. So that definitely indicates that there is a you know, tendency of dominance of some, some species. They have adaptability to grow in such condition. So how, how do you model address this? And I'm sure that is happening in the nature, though you know, it's not in NPP, but yeah. Thank you, Hamanti. Very, very good questions. So I'll take a simple question first. <laughs> the, the, the diatom silicate, you know, the silica iron link. Um, so we are accounting, and I think most models they're accounting for a kind of effect of the degree of iron stress on the uh, degree of silicification. And we have done 
in the past, actually, quite a lot of experiments around this, mostly linked to the last glacial maximum. So these ideas that when you add more dust into the Southern Ocean during glacial period, you change the degree of silicification, you change the exports of silica to low latitudes, um, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the really tough question you asked was about the kind of flexibility in the community, community change and adaptation, acclimation. And, you know, the short answer is, is that many of the models, they account for some degree of plasticity, right? So we, we do account for some plasticity in the iron requirements. That's why we allow the organisms to, to take up more iron than the required quota. That's why we can stimulate uh, iron uptake when they're iron limited. But this is done in a very crude manner. And I think you're asking, you're asking a much more detailed um, mechanistic question about how when you, you know, we know that when we change the iron concentrations, as you say, we see some degree of physiological adjustment. You know, they can replace uh, cytochrome B6 or plastocyanin that, that swaps out an iron demand for a copper demand. They can change the architecture of their photosystems, the ratio of photosystem one to photosystem two. That can have a massive saving in the iron economy. Um, they also change their cell size, which has some interaction also with the with the silicates. But we don't have a good mechanistic understanding there. And I think we don't also understand really in situ how the systems are adapting and evolving. We have a very limited understanding. Um, and I think what's important to think about is the timescales over which the adaptation may occur and how that links to the timescales of the kind of perturbation of the system. And, and I think about that because when we are worried about that at the moment, actually just driven by temperature, right? We are interested, we have a project yeah. with one of my students uh, looking at the thermal niche and how the thermal niche may change for some tropical phytoplankton because obviously they're already living on the edge in the yeah, tropics. Yeah. You warm the ocean a little bit. You are predicting actually exclusion in, in some areas of the of the ocean, but of course organisms they will have an, an opportunity to adapt to those changing temperatures. Um, and we don't really yet. Well, we're trying to think about the sort of timescales of change and the timescales of adaptation. Um, yeah. So it's a very good question because even the more complicated, generally the more complicated your mo ecosystem model becomes. You know, the more and more phytoplankton groups that you include, the simpler and simpler the physiology becomes. Yeah. Because you cannot carry so many traces in the model, you know, the comp computational overhead comes higher. Yeah. So you have this kind of trade-off. You might have a simple model with a couple of different types of phytoplankton. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you feel long-term experiments are needed, so we should go for long-term, several generations. Like when you experiment I think it depends. It depends on the question you're trying to answer. I think. I think it depends on if we want to look at the long-term evolution. And, sorry. You want to close it, no? I want to close. If there is some. <laughs> yeah, Someone is having a chat about something. <laughs> So I think what I what I mean what I would be interested in is you know how we can address this problem in natural assemblages, right? So we are doing a lot of these experiments in the lab. You know, how can we exploit the natural variability? Can we set up monitoring stations, time series, you know, augmented observatories? We talk about them sometimes of like roll, you know, picking a time series station where, for instance, you know, you guys go to in the Indian Ocean that you can go to again and again and again and you start to understand. <laughs> and the evolution of the system, right? If you think about what we have learned from bats and hot, the time series stations, um, I'm always very cautious about one-off occupations, right? Where you, you get one set of data from one location, it's difficult to address questions of evolution adaptation with that. And similarly, when we, while we can do it in the lab, we know that in the ocean, we have to worry about the whole microbiome, right? The whole association mm -hmm phytoplankton and bacteria and in the lab we have azenic cultures which is you know yeah anyway i think it's a very tough question and a, a, prior, a high priority question i think okay thank you so much i wish to meet you sometimes maybe during your visit in thanks a lot so. thank you okay thanks a lot okay
So actually now next question I was uh, referring to you one uh, our colleague uh, from Four Pi Institute, uh, Bangalore, Dr. Swati. Dr. Swati, please. Uh, Professor Togliyo, your wonderful talk. I, I have one short question about sinking speeds of particulate matter, so which will have an influence on the scavenging. So is there an agreement between different models about the sinking speed or in earlier models it used to be a tunable thing and uh, so what is the situation now? Good question. Um, yeah, absolutely. There's a big, you know, it's a big area of research, as you can imagine, from all the bio folks interested in the biological carbon pump. You know, they are looking a lot at this. So generally, you know, we are still leaving at that. So the sinking speed, uh, it remains a kind of tunable parameter in these models. But I think what's been added to this is some consideration of the liability of the organic carbon associated with the particles and the inclusion of non-organic carbon particles. So for instance, lithogenic particles, calcium carbonate, biogenic silica, which of course will have very different both sinking speeds and kind of attenuation with, uh, with depth. The problem of course we have is that the data gives us insight into the whole particle size spectrum, right? That in reality, you've got a bunch of particles, which are small ones are aggregating to become big ones. Big ones are disaggregating to become small ones. They all have different sinking speeds and they're, you know, the, the worry is about the kind of stickiness and how they are interacting with each other. And with the iron side of the story, this becomes very complicated because you have these two ways actually that scavenging is, is occurring. The first is a more classical adsorptive idea that there is some free iron which is sticking to the particles and then it goes wherever that particle goes. So if it sinks fast, it will be removed very quickly from the euphotic zone. If it sinks slowly, it will stay there and maybe it can be remobilized by some grazer or a remineralization. The difficult bit with iron is the, the fact that a large fraction of the dissolved iron is present as colloids, right? Very small particles which actually are following a completely different set of rules. Right? They are worried about things like turbulence and coagulation and how that promotes interaction between particles um, and how they then stick together to form larger particles, which may sink. And then you have this, this issue that you know, we worry about a lot, which is the fact that particles are very heterogeneous, right? They are not you know, conceptually, we think of them maybe like a golf ball or a ping pong ball sinking through the ocean, but they are very complex uh, structures with microenvironments, uh, low oxygen potentially at the interior. And people are starting to work on this. Um, I think what's really providing a catalyst for the particles is the advent of these kind of optical sensors, which are giving information into the particle dynamics, which of course can then be put onto floats and gliders, and you can suddenly explode your data set whereas previously we had to use sediment traps and things like this which were very limited in terms of the depth resolution and these kinds of things so i think it's a big you know we still i think there's still a school of models which are modeling particles in a very simple way you know they are using the, i don't know if you recall the kind of martin kind of b value you know the kind of attenuation of the flux with depth as a tunable parameter of the model you know you and there are some models that are still doing that other models are representing particles explicitly in the model. So they are ascribing sinking speeds, they're ascribing remineralization rates. And so then the kind of attenuation of the particle with depth becomes an emergent property of the model and, and will actually be affected by things like changing oxygen, changing temperature, et cetera, et cetera. So you would imagine there, there is a potential for a very strong feedback. Um, and all I would end by saying, and, and then I, I might need to go, Sunil, because I need to make lunch for the children, but uh, <laughs> is um, we are learning a lot about particles from other trace metals. So people are working on modeling things like thorium and protactinium, which are very particle reactive elements, uh, but they have no biological role. So they are very, you know, much more simple to put into the model. But they then, because they are particle reactive, looking at the way in which your model thorium and protactinium is matching the data, you are learning about your particle dynamics in your model by a kind of indirect way. You are getting some information. And so 
this has helped us at least with our model to understand that we are maybe underestimating the abundance of particles at depth because we cannot reproduce the thorium data. Um, whereas the carbon data and the nutrient data, there's no obvious issue with it. So I think there are lots of opportunities from new tracers, like some of the, the trace elements, which give us insight onto particles, and then new data from the kind of optical sensors, which are moving this field uh, forward. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Very good point. Okay, okay. I, I, I know Alessandro, you have to rush, I think. So we, I think uh, this is the reason actually I wanted you to be here because uh, still a lot of questions are there. I know, I know you have to go. Now we have question from Suresh, Manikandan, Neeraj, and uh, Unikrishnan, but I think I, you have to leave. So maybe I will ask these people to send the question to you and you can answer by email. Because uh, you cannot afford to skip the lunch or dinner for lunch for your kids. <laughs> So the problem at the moment is that because there is some, uh, annoyingly, there is some COVID case in the school, so all the children are at home. Um, so <laughs> I, we have to, I have to now do some uh, home schooling uh, after the lunch. Like, so, no, no, uh, I, I've taken your uh, lot of time, so it was fantastic. And I still, like, you can see everybody, all the uh, speaking to the top, so you can see how people are interested in this talk. So you have to make sure that you come sometime at the back. So thank you very much for the Indian audience and your person and thanks a lot. Thank you, Sunil, and thanks everybody for all the excellent questions. I've really enjoyed the discussion that we have had actually after the after the talk as well. We have covered a large a large set of subjects actually, from uh, sediments to particles to biogeochemistry modeling, biology, and um, so. That's been a really great discussion, and yeah, with luck, uh, we can uh, we can have a longer interaction in in person sometime in the future. We had a one hour almost uh, question answer session. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's great. Well, I like to talk, Sunil, so it's not. Uh, <laughs> I'm happy to do it. That's the fun part of the job, right? Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, and every thanks to all the audience. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks everyone for the questions. Brilliant. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a nice uh, nice evening there. Okay, thanks. Ciao, thank you, bye-bye. Yeah, bye.